shut up, you listen to my monkey mouth. As a companion, when you got pun on the canoe route, hopped in a portal and got in a fight. Elias knocked him out. Bow, Marco fighting style. Bow, you will see he tapped out. Bow, we win, we get crowned. Monkey mouth, monkey mouth, monkey mouth, monkey mouth. Alrighty, Armchair Army, welcome back to another iteration of Armchair Mixed Martial Arts. On this episode, we're going to be reviewing UFC 279. It was a crazy set of fights. I'm also going to go over the fight night that happened between uh, UFC 278 and 279. Uh, it was uh, gone and Tui Vasa, but I mean, let's let's just talk about what everybody wants to hear about right now. It's UFC 279. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a conspiracy person, man. 9-11 was an inside job. I'm telling you guys right now that there was some fuckery afoot uh, at UFC 280. I think it's just a little too perfect that they had Kevin Holland fighting at a catch weight at 180 pounds. Uh, I think it's crazy that Kamzat missed weight by almost 10 pounds like the dude has made 170 on like almost no time's notice so just seems unlikely to me that Kamzat wouldn't be able to make that weight whenever it came right down to it uh what else is fishy uh there was apparently all this chaos in the back but nobody got any footage like show me a clip show me some clips other than that, like blatantly staged thing that they showed us from from the UFC's marketing department, you know, everybody has cell phones. There's at least a hundred people back there. I mean, there was a brawl between several entourages. I mean, Kevin Holland and Kamzat, their entourages got into it, and then immediately thereafter, Nate and Kamzat's entourage got into it as well, and uh, and no one got any footage of this no one there's n no video out there on youtube or nowhere like i don't know man i'm I, I think it's a little sus if i'm speaking from the heart what i think happened is the ufc and their big data god marketing department crunching the numbers saw that, like, the way they were treating Nate Diaz rubbed a significant portion of the of the MMA fandom the wrong way. Uh, and I think that they saw that the uh, pay-per-views weren't being bought very proactively, and I think that they uh, pulled a stunt. I think they pulled a stunt to, like, create some drama before the fight with this drama that unfolded backstage that we didn't get any actual footage of. Uh, and then I think that it helped them uh, pivot out of the bad PR move that was throwing in Nate against the Chechenian wolf that is uh, Kamzat Shemaev. Uh, I think that it's a little awkward that Kamzat missed weight by almost 10 pounds and was just like, eh, it's not that bad. I just feel like Kamzat, like, I've seen a bunch of interviews from that guy, and it seems like he really, really does care about this sport and about trying to do well in it. And it just blows my mind that someone who's that committed and cares that much about doing well in the sport would be so, like, nonchalant about uh, missing weight and doing it. Because that's, like, something that the UFC doesn't fuck around about at all. Uh, the UFC, like, gives guys really hard times about missing weight. It's one of those, like... It's one of those things on the short list of things that they don't like you to do, and yet he did it, and he did it by a lot. Like, it's not like he missed it by a half pound. Like, he rocket-shipped past 170. He was up around 180, which is, again, right where Kevin Holland was proactively sitting, just however so, like, conveniently and coincidentally. And uh, I think that anybody who's, like, trained in the art of investigation knows better than to believe in coincidence. And I think that this thing just reeks of coincidence. And so my mind immediately goes to, well, there's human intention making these, coinc these coinciding events happen simultaneously. Uh, you can almost guarantee it. Um, so 
you know, between there being no footage of the altercation in the back. Comms not missing weight by a significant amount that I don't believe he would as a professional. Him seemingly not caring about them missing the weight. Them having Kevin Holland in the clip at 180 already fighting out a weird catch weight. Uh, them bringing on Tony Ferguson as, a, as someone who they knew he'd be able to pivot well to. <clears throat> it just all... There's just too many things that add up to it's more than likely that the UFC did something funky here. I don't have the proof, <clears throat> right? I, I, I wasn't back there. I wasn't in the room. I wasn't a fly on the wall. But if I had to, like, gamble, right? Like, if it was my money on the line, I'd say the UFC uh, realized that the move they made with Nate and Combs, that was a bad move. And, like, they... I think that, like, Combs, that... Nate and Tony were probably in on it. That was about it. Um, I think that it was going to be whoever they could get at the catch weight at 180 for Kamzat, whether that was Kevin Holland or Daniel Rodriguez or whoever, right? They'd have thrown anybody to that wolf at that point. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that Kamzat knew that he wasn't going to make the weight. I think that he knew that it was cool. Um, and I think that uh, he took a fall for the UFC and he's going to try and like embrace a heel role for the sake of his corporate overlords. And uh, this the whole thing reeks, man. The whole thing really reeks like to high hell. So uh, that's my two cents on the matter uh, in terms of the drama that unfolded around UFC 279. Um, but uh, to talk about the fights, man, the fights were incredible. Like to get off the drama and the bullshit and talk about uh, what happened in the actual fights. I'm much more enthusiastic about that. So, <clears throat> damn. I swear I don't have a sore throat. <clears throat> I just got some... It's cedar outside. Cedar fever outside. I literally went outside earlier. And uh, my truck was like literally covered in a thin layer of pollen. Uh, it's pretty pretty unreal. Pretty unreal. The amount of, uh, the amount of shit that the trees around here will put out. Uh, R.I.P. the buffalo, man. The buffalo used to come out and kill out all the cedar. And then we killed out all the buffaloes. So now there's cedar everywhere. And... The atmosphere is trying to kill us for it. Congrats, white men. Y'all won. We won. Yuck. Shit was not a net positive for the squad. Um, so, Chris Barnett, uh, which, shout out, Barnett gang, called it. Called it. That's my dude. Uh, was getting his ass kicked in the first round. And uh, Jake Collier kind of went for like a... A kind of sloppy takedown attempt, and uh, Chris Barton, uh, Chris Barnett just worked his feet well. Right, he's got amazing footwork. You can tell by the way he dances. Um, the guy probably played some football, right? Being that big with that good of footwork, definitely played some football. But either that or it's just from dancing. One of the two. Like it could definitely be from his dancing. His his foot. Like, he's he's an incredible dancer. But uh, he was able to move his feet and get away from Jay Collier. Uh, and took his back and just rained down shots, uh, and Jake tried to get away several times, but uh, Chris managed to stay on top and kept raining down the ground and pound until the ref had seen enough and ultimately had to stop the fight, and it was a great win for him. Uh, he literally got like two big beers on the way out. It looked like it was, it looked like it was last call at the bar for Chris Barnett, man. He was having a blast, and uh, as a Barnett, I'm proud, to, uh, I'm proud of him, man. I'm happy to see that he went out and got his win and had a good time. Uh, Dennis Tululin got a uh, got a TKO in the second round towards the end of the second round over Jamie Pickett. Uh, that was a really fun fight. Uh, Jelton Almeida uh, just looked in it like an entirely different category of uh, of talent on the ground. Uh, he went to the ground and there uh, the, his uh, opponent Anton Turkalj. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name. Uh, was definitely in over his head. Um, that's why he was tapped out at the end of the first round. Uh, Julian Arosa, uh, man, beat up Hakeem Dabadu. Like, uh, looked great, man. Looked really, really good. Like, out of everybody on this, uh, preliminary card, man, he was one of the guys who really, really impressed me, man. Um, with the way that he was able to just grind and, and, uh, and he just was winning all the exchanges, man. He's looked a step ahead. And, uh, yeah, the experience paid off in that one is all you can really say. He's a very experienced fighter and uh, deserves every bit of good that comes his way. 
uh, Johnny Walker got the win over Eon Kute Lava. I had called this one as well. Um, I was expecting him to get the win with the strikes, but he actually got it with a submission at the end of the first round, four minutes and 37 seconds into the first round. He, uh, just his, he took his back, and his arms are so long, man. Like, such long arms for that weight class that... Um, Ian Kute Lava just had a really, really hard time uh, getting away from the choke attempts, and Johnny Walker stayed persistent with it and finally wound up sinking one in, and uh, that was that. Irene Aldana got the uh, TKO at 2 minutes and 20 seconds into the third round uh, over Macy Shison. Congratulations to her. She looked amazing. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez got a, got a decision win over Li Jing Lang, um, which... I wasn't expecting. I actually thought Lee was going to get that job done, but I mean, again, I was just—I can't doubt Danny Rodriguez. He's—he's he's won several fights in a row that, like, every time I was like, "Eek, I don't know," and he keeps winning, right? Like, the guy's a winner, and that's what it comes down to. Um, so, congrats to him for getting a good win. Um, going to be interesting to see what comes next for him. Uh, it was a really good sport taking the taking the fight on short notice to keep the card together against a really dangerous um, Lee Jing Ling at a catch weight. Uh, Kamzat Chimaev uh, cut through Kevin Holland like a hot knife through butter. It is what it is, man. I'm a big Kevin Holland fan. I was, man, really hoping that Kevin Holland would do something amazing, man. But uh, Kamzat, I mean, literally went out there, took him down, locked on a darse. And, like, Kevin Holland, like, defended it very effectively for, uh, you know, a little while. Like, he put, like, th I feel like there were three really, really good attempts at getting away from that choke that he that he did. And just comes out was too good. Stayed on top of him. Choked him out. Kevin Holland secured the bag. Comes out, saved the day, taking the fall for the UFC. Um, you know, wins all around, to be honest. Right, um... It's probably like the, the, the kindest way that Kamzat could have put Kevin Holland out, right? He could have got on top of him and just beat the, his holy shit out of him. Um, but instead, he, he just cinched up a choke and, you know, Kevin Holland was able to tap and went home really, I think, without even getting punched in the face once. So, quick night at the office, uh, minimal, minimal, uh, minimal damage taken. Uh, you know, MMA career is still turning in a positive direction. Pockets are padded. Uh, let's fucking go for everybody. Uh... It's going to be interesting to see what they do with Kamzat. Obviously, uh, if you don't live in the world where it's a big conspiracy and he missed weight intentionally for the sake of helping out the UFC, preserving their image because they were doing a, a legend dirty, uh, and you have to look at it like he was someone who was coming in trying to make weight and missed weight by 10 pounds, then uh, you definitely have to be concerned about his ability to make 170 moving forward. I do love that Joe Rogan uh, asked him about the weight cut in the in the post fight interview, and whenever Kamzat tried to be like, "I don't give a fuck about that," uh, Joe doubled down and was like, "Look, man, if you're going to be competing at 170, then like the brass of this organization need to be confident that you can make 170." And so there's like stuff floating around where they're saying that a doctor came and checked on Kamzat and basically determined that uh, he couldn't keep cutting weight, and that's why. He was a little closer, and after the doctor told him to stop, he just went ahead and started drinking water again because there was no point. Like, he'd already cut as much as he could, and the doctor was telling him no. And so it didn't matter if he walked across the scale at 174 or 180. It was going to be all the same to him because he wasn't making the weight, and so he might as well just drink his water now. And that uh, he felt like he could make the weight, and that it was just a, a bad decision of the, uh, of the, of the doctor. Now, uh... I saw on uh, Brandon the Shab show. I'm a big fan of Brandon Shab. You didn't know I am. Have been for a long time. I literally watched uh, like the podcast, like the day of whenever Joe Rogan was like, "You need to do podcasting and get out of mixed martial arts." And like, I've literally been co-signing on what that guy's been doing ever since. So it's been neat to watch uh, his trajectory, and I'm hoping that I can emulate something similar. But either way. Uh, I saw where he was saying that he had spoken with Neil Magny, who's a former training partner of his, and Neil Magny was like, man, that's weird. 
you know, I've done a lot. I mean, if you don't know about Neil Magny, the guy's had a hundred fucking UFC fights. The guy's a legend. He's literally like tied or has actually surpassed George St. Pierre for the number of wins in his, in, in 170. And so he's like, a, a legend in the sport is like no offense or buts about it. And he's like, I've never been approached by a physician during the middle of my cut. So I don't know. That might have been again a thing that the UFC did. The UFC was like, "Hey, UFC doc, go check on comms lot. We know everybody's cutting lots of weight. If you go actually take a hard look at him, you'll be able to determine that the amount of water that he's uh, forcing out of his body isn't necessarily healthy. You can tell him to stop, and we can blame you. You know. So, who knows, man? It's all a bit. It was all a big shit show, but." Um, He's saying, Kamzad is saying that he wants to, to take the belt at 170 and 185. So we'll see if he can do that. Um, I know that it's it, it's looking like a 170's his, if he can make that weight, man. I mean, the guy is on another level in terms of his physicality and his aggression. And uh, yeah, like it's a fight. You're in a real fight when you go in there and step in the octagon with that guy. It isn't a sport. It's a fight at that point. And, uh, and he's going to use all those, like, professional skills. <laughs> like, he's a, he's a dangerous guy. Um, I'm a big fan, honestly. It's, it's, been a, it's been a pretty spectacular thing to watch that guy fight. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. So, uh, yeah, the guy's really good. I'm excited to see what comes up next from him. I'm certain that, like, the UFC is going to brush his 10-pound weight cut under the rug. And him potentially jeopardizing this whole card under the rug. And they're going to keep riding the comms out money train to the best of their ability. Then uh, the main event, obviously, was shuffled around to be Nate Diaz and Tony Ferguson. And this was just the MMA gods smiling on Nate Diaz, right? Nate Diaz got a fight that was winnable. Uh, and he did win. He got, he, got a, he got a finish. He got a submission victory in the fourth round uh, via a, a guillotine choke, right? And so it's one of those things where... It all kind of <clears throat> ended really poetically, right? Like really, really poetically for Nate, getting a choke finish against another legend. Uh, they were both super. Uh, him and Tony were both super respectful to one another. And uh, and before I go off into what's next for Nate, I'll go into what's next for Tony because I don't know what's next for Tony. He hasn't been winning at one fifty five. He took a trip up to one seventy to see if he could make it work, and then immediately lost. So, I don't know. Tony's a legend in the sport. I'd love to see him, see him be able to fight as long as he wants to. Maybe start having him gatekeep somewhere around the bottom of the top 15. I don't know. I don't know. It, it gets tough whenever guys have floated around the very, very top and they start to slip. And all of a sudden, they're only catching, like, the biggest, hungriest sharks that are on the come up. And they go on these tough skids. And then people start to think that they ain't shit. When really, like, Tony Ferguson's an absolute monster who's just on the other side of the hill, who is being fed guys who are on the come up on the right side of the hill. And so it's just a vicious, unfriendly sport, man. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what's next for him. I hope that he can get a couple more fun fights in. And he's able to, like, exit on terms that are, like, copacetic between him and the UFC, and he's able to leave happily. That's what I want. Um, but I, I don't necessarily know the roadmap between here and there if I'm being really, really frank. Uh, what's next for Nate Diaz is he goes and makes a goddamn shitload of money. That's what's next. I think that he's, uh, like, perfect world roadmap for Nate because I'm a Nate Diaz fan, have been for a long time, even though I was saying he was probably going to lose against Kamzat. I don't feel bad about it. It was the, I was like the, it was the truth. Come beat me up, Nate. It is what it is. Um, still, still your boy. I'm still a big fucking fan. I'll hit the fattest fucking dab with you. I swear to God, we'll blast off to space together. But between here and there, uh, I think perfect world scenario is Jake Paul wins his fight against Anderson Silva. Nate and Jake Paul fight boxing. Nate wins that fight against Jake Paul, further developing his star power. Then, 
he goes back and signs a one fight deal with the UFC to get the trilogy fight in with Connor. And then him and Connor both ride off into the sunset, rich as hell. That's what I want for Nate Diaz. I hope that now, obviously, there are some things that need to align. Connor needs to stay off the cocaine. Jake Paul needs to actually win his fight. And both of those things seem like uh, they are less probable than the other. So, uh, yeah, I feel like uh, it's probably pretty improbable that all, that that plan of mine comes together in the perfect world. But uh, I hope it's what happens. I feel like that's what Nate is uh, gunning towards. I know that Nate also has um, he has a, a promotion now, Real Fight Inc. Real Fight Real Fight Inc. Um, which I was going to call this the, the Real Fight Inc. 1 review instead of the UFC 279 review, but uh, I was high and forgot to mention it, so here we are, UFC 279 slash RFI 1 review. Let's go. Um, but, yeah, man, I-, I couldn't be happier for Nate, right? Like, the stars aligned for Nate. He got a win over a legend, developed his star power on the way out, he gets to go chase humongous money bags with, with, you know, circus fights with Jake Paul. And there's always the trilogy floating out there. And now he's a completely free uh, free agent, no longer under the thumb of, of the UFC. And even Connor was, like, giving him his props. Like, it's a fair play. You're now the biggest, you're now the biggest uh, free agent in mixed martial arts and, like, congrats basically and we'll get our trilogy in and i think that's the generally the demeanor is um everybody understood that the ufc was more or less getting in the way of nate getting to his bag and nate has finally been able to get them out of the way so that he can go and get to his money the way that he's been deserving to this whole time so i'm really really pumped to see what's going to happen next with nate um, he's my boy, and I can't wait to see him get that humongous big cash money wad between now and the future. Uh, looking back, though, uh, Cyril Gon tax Tai Tuivasa's ass. I didn't think that Cyril was going to get the win, um, but uh, he looked great, man. And uh, it was his body work, those those body those body kicks. Like I've been I've been saying body work a lot on the podcast a lot recently, man. Because there's been uh, a lot of a lot of these fights have been being determined by the body work. It's been really incredible to see what's happened in, in the UFC here recently. And you know, Tai Tuivasa was uh, Mark Hunt's sparring partner for a really long time, so he's got like a, a head like a cinder block, so he's really hard to knock out. But um, whenever he's getting kicked to the body and he's being completely compromised in that way. <clears throat> Damn. Mm-mm. Give me a sec. I didn't get my tea. Fuck it. Oh, Texas sweet tea, my God. Lifesaver. But, uh, as I was saying, Ty's got a head like a cinder block, but there's not a whole lot you can do whenever your stamina goes because you've been getting kicked to the liver. And I saw him getting hurt, hurt, hurt to the body before the finish came, and I, I just knew. I mean, at the end of the, what was it, a third round? At the end of the second round, I could tell that Ty was, like, in a bad way. And then, like, halfway through the third round, it was looking real rough. And then Cyril got it done, man. Uh, and, you know, he ultimately did, like, get the knockout, right? Like, he knocked him out. He's he, But it was the body work that set him up. He got hit to the liver, and it folded him. And then he got swarmed and got hit with a big, a big right hand and set on the ground and followed up with some ground and pound. And it was a great win for Cyril, man. It was in France right he's a big frenchman they had a whole bunch of french fighters on the card and a whole bunch of them won uh the french crowd was absolutely ecstatic It was a big day for mixed martial arts in france and i really like it, it couldn't be like more poetically put together for cyril gone so i'm happy for him that it worked out the way it did 
Uh, I'm sad for Ty. I'm a bigger fan of Ty than I am of Cyril, but that's just because, I mean, who doesn't like Ty fucking taking shoeies and being a madman? But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next with these guys. I'm, I mean, the, the, top of, the top of the heavyweight division is insane right now. I mean, it is absolute insanity, especially with John Jones stepping off into the mix, which we will talk about a little bit later. I do believe that they're going to be getting John Jones on a card by the end of the year. I think, uh, I think it's going to be the card where they've got uh, Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler coming up, which they just confirmed, right? So I think that I think the only thing that can really top that is is going to be putting John Jones on. If you're not going to have those guys be the be the be the main attraction, then it's got to be something bigger than that. There's only so many things that are bigger than those two guys fighting together. Um, but on the co-main of the Gone to Ivasa card, there was Robert Whitaker versus Marvin Vittori, who won a unanimous three-round decision. Robert Whitaker looked great. Uh, head kicks were fantastic. He really started to time Marvin Vittori's uh, head movement down and caught him with a few big head kicks that really seemed like the primary differentiator in the fight to me. Um, so congrats to him. He's in another tough spot. He's like the best middleweight in the world who isn't named Israel out of Sonya. So he's going to keep, I guess, gatekeeping for, for Israel. See if you beat, if you beat Robert, you get to challenge, uh, Izzy. Well, no, it's a tough spot. It's a tough spot for him, man. Um, it really is. So there's gone to Ivas. So we've gone over it. Okay, so now uh, moving forward uh, between the fight cards that uh, so I'm going to go over the fight cards that are happening between 279 and I'm going to cover the up to 280. Uh, and so, but we're just going to do it really quickly. I don't want to go too deep off into any of this. Um, but we've got Corey Sandhagen versus Song Yadong. Uh, I feel like this is Corey's fight. Um, Song Yadong is like not uh, not a chump at all, but I definitely feel like. Uh, this is like a get back on track fight for Corey Sandhagen and to say like he's off track is a little disrespectful right like he's only had a couple losses to like guys at the very very tip of the spear and the the one against TJ Dillashaw was suspect as hell in my opinion so uh, you know it's just that they're just trying to get him back oriented in the right direction I, I think they I think the UFC has a lot of stock and a lot of belief in uh in Corey Sandhagen and I think that they have a, I think that they want to see him win I want to see him win and I think that this is a good opportunity for him to do that but I mean no disrespect to Song everybody has a puncher's chance and I think that he could definitely get it done but I, I would comfortably gamble a pretty hefty amount on Corey Sandhagen for this fight Chidi and Jukwai and uh Gregory Rodriguez are going to be fighting um, I've picked against Gregory Rodriguez once, and he made me look like a dumbass. So, uh, I watched, uh, RoboCop, uh, win the middleweight championship. Uh, or was it 205? I think it might have won the championship at 205. But either way, I watched him win the, uh, the LFA championship, and, uh, they're like a feeder league for the UFC, and he's been on a tear ever since, man. Um, he's got really great cardio, he's a big muscle-bound dude, his boxing is crisp, um, I feel like Chidi's probably the more explosive of the two athletes. If I had to pick, I want to pick Gregory Rodriguez, man. I'm not going to be made a fool by that guy again. I, I've learned my lesson. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to have to pick him on that one. Uh, Andre Feely versus Bill Algio. That's a fun fight. Uh, I like, I like, uh, Andre Feely. That's my dude. Always been a big, uh, Andre Touchy Feely fan. Well, we're going to see. It can go either way though. My heart tells me Andre Feely. We've got another UFC fight night coming up on October 1st. That's a headline between Mackenzie Dern and Yang Zainan. Uh, I got to go Mackenzie Dern, bro. Uh, I, I got to be real honest. Before Mackenzie Dern had her child, I wasn't really big on Mackenzie Dern. I felt like uh, she was having weight cut issues and that like I felt like because of that, there were potentially some like diet and nutrition issues or maybe some uh maybe some like uh, commitment whenever it came to the weight cutting issues i didn't know it seemed like something was missing um but since she's had her girl she has been on an absolute terror and i don't think that anybody's gonna stop her anytime soon i gotta pick Mackenzie dern i think she's gonna choke her out or she's gonna put her in an arm bar those are the two i think it's like second round submission at the latest if not first round submission to be like if i'm 
if I'm being really, really honest about what I think is going to happen. But we'll see. We'll always see. Uh, Cody Garbrandt versus Ronnie Yaya. This is a, man, that's a tough fight for Cody Garbrandt, man. Ronnie Yaya is not a slouch, but mm, oh, yeah, I don't pick Cody Garbrandt. It's a hard thing. You know, it's, Cody Garbrandt's had a rough skid, man. Um, but I, I like Cody Garbrandt in this fight, if I'm being really honest. We got Randy Rudeboy Brown versus Francisco Trinaldo. I hate picking against Francisco Trinaldo because he's old and he always proves me wrong, man. But I'm a big Randy Rudeboy fan, so let's go Randy Rudeboy on that. A few other fights. Roni Barcelos, Trevin Jones, Jessica Pinne, Tabitha Ricci, John Gastonada, Daniel Santos. All fights that I don't necessarily want to pick, but that I think will ultimately be very entertaining on the night of. Then we got UFC Fight Night Grosso versus Araujo. Alexa Grosso versus Vivian Araujo. Uh, man, these girls are going to fight it out. Women's flyweight, uh, you know, the, the, the small girls always uh, fight it out real, real hard. Um, they have so much, uh, they have so much energy. They have so much stamina. They just fight it out the entire time. Um, so it, it'll be an interesting fight. If I gotta pick it, I'm probably gonna go Alexa Grosso with a little bit more experience, and I think that her skill set's gonna translate better. Uh, if it'll be a close one, though, be a close one. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be like shocked if it went either way. But if I'm having to pick it, it's the main event. I'll pick Alexa Grosso. Misha Serkinov versus Alonzo Minifield. Alonzo Minifield is my dude. Uh, I sponsored him for a spell with uh, with one of my other companies, Rad Extremities. Um, he played football. Uh, at Texas A&M Commerce, my buddy Aaron, um, yeah, so, like, the, the connections run deep with old Alonzo, man, and I, and I really, really hope the best for him, um, yeah, he's a super, super athletic guy, um, punches like a Mack truck, he's just gotta put it all together, and he's in a good camp with Sergeant M over at Fortis, um, and so I, I think it can be a, a really, really good thing. I have very, very high hopes for Alonzo, and if he beats Misha Serkinov, that's going to be a, a really, really big feather in his cap. Because Misha Serkinov has been around the been around the block and is a very dangerous guy. Um, so yeah, we're going to see. Uh, we've got Rafael Asansal versus Victor Henry. Um, man, Rafael Asansal, uh seems over the hill in my world, man. Like, last couple times I've seen him fight, he's seeming old. So I'm going to go Victor Henry on that, even though I don't necessarily know enough about him to make a really, really strong case for him or to uh, feel super confident in the pick. But um, I know I, I don't have a lot of stock in Asansal these days. Jared Kennedy and Sean Strickland got canceled. That stinks. I believe that they got something set up for those guys in the near future. I, I got a list of notes that we'll go over here in a little bit. We'll see if that comes back up. We got UFC 280, Charles Oliveira and Islam Makachev, the fight that we've all been wanting at lightweight, man. I mean, everyone knows Charles Oliveira is the champ. Islam Makachev is like the closest thing to Khabib we've had since Khabib, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in that one. Uh, I like Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira is uh, is crazy, a, a wild man. But you know, Islam Makachev, he's so conservative. You know, it's going to be hard to beat that guy over the course of five rounds because he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna play everything so conservatively and he's gonna do everything right. Um, it's too close to call, man. Like my heart says Charles Oliveira, my brain says Islam Makachev. If my money was really on the line like if if like if i had to make a pick i'd pick islam makachev and i hate to say that because i'm such a big dubronx fan but uh, it's just there's something about these dagestani dudes that are coming out of this camp where they're just so disciplined and they know how to win a fight they like they, they're gonna they're gonna do what they have to to minimize the damage they're gonna receive and they're gonna control you and they're gonna like you can't deny it they won the fight they're they're good at the shit, so I think it's gonna be the Islam Makashev coming out party. I hope that I hope that New Bronx gets it done. Aljamain Sterling, TJ Dillashaw. I'm pulling Aljamain Sterling on this one. I feel like this should be Sandhagen in this fight. I don't like that 
TJ Dillashaw got the win over Sandhagen by pressing forward whenever it, it felt to me like Sandhagen had the uh, advantage in effective striking and aggression. TJ Dillashaw was just owning the center of the octagon and marching forward. It's my opinion on the deal. Ultimately, he's up here fighting for the he's up here fighting for the for the the championship. So, congrats to him. We're gonna see how it goes. But I got to pick Aljamain Sterling, Peter Yan, Sean O'Malley. Let's go, Sean O'Malley, man. I mean, my my heart says Sean O'Malley, my head says Peter Yan. But it's a funner pick for Sean O'Malley. He's a weed guy. I'm a weed guy. He's an American. I'm an American. Peter Yan, you can fucking go do whatever you do over there in Russia. Um, those are actually the only three cards that the only three fights that we have confirmed for UFC 280 so far so I can't go too much further off into that but now we can get off into just like some general bullshit that's happened in the UFC world and in the world of mixed martial arts between here and there uh, it has been a couple weeks since I put out an episode I did miss my UFC 279 preview that I would have typically done um, just experiencing technical difficulties on my end. On you know, I'm, I'm a one-man squad. Typically, I do have my business partner, Mikey, but um, I pretty much head up uh, fixing all the tech stuff, and we came into some tech problems, and I am uh, playing it by the edge of my seat, man, figuring the stuff out as I go. And, uh, yeah, just wound up getting into a situation where I figured out the tech stuff a little too late and didn't really have the time or availability to get this thing done the way it needed to be done properly. So I put it off. And uh, we wound up not getting one done last week. But uh, that being said, we're going to have an extra dense layer of stuff to talk about because I was preparing to get it done last week. And I just couldn't quite pull it off with everything that was going on. So I have uh, the notes that I would have talked about during last week's fight as well. Uh, the first thing that actually happened here more recently than my old notes, but I felt like it needed to be at the top of the list, was Elias Theodoro succumb to liver cancer, y'all. I had no idea. I had no idea he was fighting that. I had no idea what was going on. He must have kept it very quiet. On, wasn't talking about it on social media or what have you. Um, condolences to like him and his family and anybody who's been, uh, you know, imp who's going to be impacted in a negative way by his passing. Man, you guys are all in my heart, and uh, it's a tough deal, man. Um, it was really he was a really cool dude, man. He like won the he won the Ultimate Fighter. He was a big proponent of medical marijuana in the in the in the uh, UFC scene, which kind of cleared the way for like me being able to sponsor Alonzo with my cannabis company. And so, um, you know, there's he's his effects, the ripples in the pond that he created have literally even affected me directly. So, uh, tough one there, man. Uh, everybody goes, um, liver cancer doesn't sound like a pleasant way to go. And I'm sorry, man. Uh, I really am. And, uh, condolences to him and his family. And, uh, it was really cool how he used to do the, uh, the ring boy stuff. I think it was, uh, Invicta. Yeah, the, the girls' league and Victor used to let him carry the cards around, being a male model. It was so cool, man. Really neat thing that he was doing there. Um, so yeah, man. Between him being a ring boy and him winning the Ultimate Fighter and him being like eight and three in the UFC and him uh, doing the stuff he did for medical marijuana and just everything else, man. He's a good guy, and we we lost a good one with that one, man, for sure. But uh, Nate Diaz has started his own uh, promotion now officially called uh, Real Fight Inc. Um, RFI. That's cool for him, man. I'm really, I'm really pumped. Uh, I think that there's plenty of food on the plate, uh, especially in like the feeder league range. Um, you know, I feel like if he keeps it, you know, relatively local to like, you know, the West Coast and, uh, you know, keeps uh, guys who are going to put on interesting and exciting fights and feeds them into the UFC you can make a lot of money you can make a lot of money doing that so I'm, I'm pumped for him uh, I hope it works out uh we had a, a, a chick I can't I, I can't even think her first name was Ty Ty Emery uh won her first fight in in the uh, bare knuckle fighting championship knocked a girl out and went and flashed her tits to the entire crowd which good for her i'm talking about it you're hearing about it all because she showed some tits so it's just a crazy headline man i you know I, you'd like for her to go and get eyes to her by the virtue of her talent in the in the ring but um instead we're talking about her because she flashed tits and that's the nature of uh that's the nature of life but good for her getting her win and getting some shine on my podcast um 
oh my god, Tai Tuivasa uh, turns out has been paying for his own flights because the UFC won't put him on anywhere but coach. Wow. Guys, come on. Y'all can y'all can fly these guys. If you're going to be on a pay-per-view, I think you should be able to fly something better than coach. And I feel like if you're a heavyweight being moved around by the UFC, like it's inconsiderate of the UFC to put guys next to people. Like, Can you imagine the person who would have had to have been sitting next to Ty? Or if Ty got a center seat, that big humongous motherfucker like in your seats. Man, I'm a big guy. I'm fucking 6'3", 300 pounds. Like, you're going to be in other people's seats when you're that size. And, like, Ty's a big fella. Like, I get it. I get being frustrated with that and not wanting to ride coach and wanting to have a little bit more uh, space, even if it isn't, like, a selfish thing. Like, just wanting not to negatively affect the people around you's ability to enjoy their flight and coach can be pretty much impossible if you're bigger than 5'9", a buck 70. So, I get it, Ty. I get it, homie. I used to be 500 pounds. And yeah, it's a it's 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 a problem. It's a problem. I get it. Uh, ben Rothwell is going to be uh, making his bare knuckle debut on October first against a dude named Bobo O'Bannon. And uh, you know, I don't know about Bobo O'Bannon, but I know plenty about Ben Rothwell. And the guy throws lots of punches and is a big old guy. And it's going to be like good luck anybody who's fighting Ben Rothwell in bare knuckle bare knuckle boxing. But that's something to tune into. I've I like me some bare knuckle boxing, guys. There's something special about it. Like, the way that it turns jabs into significant strikes just does it for me, right? Like, the fact that, like, these guys can catch each other with jabs and it's not just, like, a measurement slash ring control tool. It's actually, like, a strike of significance that can cut your opponent up and can, can damage them and make them concussed and make it to where you can win the fight, like, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing for me, I loved, I watched boxing on the come up, my dad had every Mike Tyson fight recorded on VHS, and I watched them all, matter of fact, I watched, like, all the entire boxing cards leading up to him, like, he didn't have just the 12 second Tyson fight, he had the whole card, so I've watched tons of boxing on the come up, and, um, yeah, it's interesting to see what, what, what how boxing changes, Whenever the bat, whenever the jab becomes a strike of significance due to the lack of padding on your hands, um, I'm, I love it. I thought it, I thought it would be too bloody, man. Like and it is sometimes, but uh, I guess I just have a stronger stomach for the blood than I thought I did, man. Uh, I, I rather enjoy, I rather enjoy watching the Bernacle fights. Call me a freak. Uh, Sean Strickland. Um, is out against the Jared Cannonier fight. Uh, it looks like they're trying to get it rearranged and get it put on something in October. Um, but we're going to see what happens with that. Uh, yeah, apparently uh, Sean Strickland, uh, his hand got infected. He, like uh, Someone's tooth broke the skin of his hand and it like swole up huge and like looked crazy he posted a video on social media but it looks fucking gross go watch it if you're into that type of shit his uh, his hands all swole up looks like you could pop it like if you just poked it with a needle it'd fucking explode so um it's real shit you know it's crazy how some of these fighters you just do it for long enough like weird stuff catches you it's like you would never think you'd never think it's just such an ox an awkward obscure thing that took him out but it did uh, a lot of people have been taken to social media saying that Cyril gone uh, fought in a dirty way. Uh, so if you if you watch the fight, uh, you know that he like kicked him to the liver, backed him up, and then hit him with like a big left hook, and really had him hurt. And like as he was going down, he like hammer fisted him on the back of the head. And it's true, he hit him on the back of the head. But that wasn't the fight. That wasn't the fight ending punch. Like the thing that set up the fight ending punch was the liver kick, and then the thing that ended the fight was that big right hand that Cyril hit Ty with whenever he stepped around him. Like the footwork, the placement, the cardio, all that. Not the not the slap to the back of the head on the way down, and. I mean, the, the three or four hammer fists to the nose when Ty was on the ground. Like, there was so much. So much more than that one shot to the back of the head. And it just happened, man. It's a it's a fight. These guys are sincerely in there fighting. He saw he had Ty hurt. He swarmed him, and he, he did what you do when you fight. And he hit that guy in the head. 
you know, and it's not what you're supposed to do, but it wasn't, it wasn't the reason why the fight ended, you know, I'm certain that, like, if he'd hammer fisted him on the back of the head, and it knocked him to the ground, and, like, the ref was able to be like, you knocked him down with that, then, like, it would have all been different, but it's not how it went, man, it was, it was, it was clean, you know, it was, it was an accidental shot, uh, and it wasn't a, a shot of major significance, and it wasn't the reason why he won the fight, so I'm not prepared to take anything away from Cyril over the shot to the back of the head, that did, in fact, happen. Uh, Ty and John Jones been talking some back and forth, but John blocked him in traditional John Jones fashion, right? They're trolling one another. They're being ugly. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't really keep up the social media stuff too, too much, but I know this, in fact, did happen. Uh, fucking Zuckerberg trains mixed martial arts and had a teammate on a recent card. Um, dude was fighting on Fight Pass on, like, Fury or something. I don't know, but, like, the bottom line is he he's training MMA which is cool man like that's you know I don't like that reptile I don't like doing I don't like being into stuff that the reptile overlords are into I'd rather him like go be off into whatever weird shit that that the global elite are into manipulating global politics rigging social media platforms so that people think the way you want them to you know, typical oligarch shit. I don't want to hear, uh, I, don't, I don't want this guy to be humanized and more likable because he's training mixed martial arts. That guy, I've had too many 30-day bans on my account for making, for talking friendly shit amongst my friends for me to ever give that guy a pass. Matter of fact, I also want to go get a membership to his gym so I can, so, to his gym so I can whoop that dude's ass. I saw them videos. Everybody was trying to, everybody's worried about getting some fucking shine, sucking that guy's wiener. Look at how good them kicks look. Great work there. The guy looked like a fucking wet noodle throwing punches. Where the guy was a dork. The guy is still a dork. He reminds me of the of the scene in Men in Black whenever the roach is wearing the human suit. He like pulls his skin back. That's like the vibe the guy has. Like he's just like a reptile wearing a human suit. I'm convinced of it. His fucking uncle works for DARPA or some shit. Fucking global elitist part of the cabal i don't want to hear about it it's part of the deal he's not that story they sold us at the movies they're all in on it that's bullshit he's not some college kid who struck it rich that guy's got mega loaded family and everywhere they're it's part of the government psyop all to keep track of what we're doing and where we're going so they can make more domestic terrorists so that they can fund their organizations it's bullshit uh how huge is alex Pahea? Man, they put a picture out of him standing next to Dominic Reyes, and the dude is legitimately bigger than Dominic Reyes. I believe that Dominic Reyes is 6'3". Alex Bahia is 6'4". Dude's 226 pounds with 9% body fat. <sighs> Do you know what 9% of 226 pounds is, bro? That's 18 pounds. That means that he's walking around at 208 pounds with that's if he eliminated every little bit of fat on his body and he was just skin bones guts and muscles bro he'd be 208 pounds and so how he's gonna get from 208 pounds down to 185 homie's got 21 pounds of straight water to cut and frankly i don't like that Okay, I don't. I don't. I think it's bad for the sport to have guys that are too big cutting weight to get down to different weight classes. I think it's bad for their bodies. I really like what one championship does with the hydration testing pretty far out, and they they make sure that you're like on weight and on water, appropriate water levels the whole time leading up to the fights. So I think that they've got it licked over there. Um, Jake Paul and Anderson Silva is confirmed, right? Y'all heard me talking about it earlier, how I hope that Nate Diaz gets Jake Paul after Jake Paul beats Anderson Silva. But the frank truth is that what's more than likely is that Anderson Silva will beat Jake Paul's ass. And uh, so according to Jake Paul, it was always his plan to fight Anderson Silva, but the point was that he was going to fight that Fury boy uh, before he fought Anderson so that he would have some experience boxing professionally against the Southpaw. Right, and he would have some sense of familiarity. Um, so now he's just going in and boxing his first ever Southpaw professionally, and it's Anderson Silva. So good luck. 
And don't talk to Dana White about this dude, Jake Paul, no more. Dana White is so pissed about, so he's not even in the same business as me. Dana, I'm going to tell you what, buddy. Combat sports is a business. Like, you can say, oh, it's boxing and one's mixed martial arts, whatever. Bro, it's combat sports. And frankly, that dude lives in Dana's head rent-free. Fucking with him about the fighter pay and all the suspect shit that Dana's doing. I love that there's someone out there who's not under Dana's thumb who's out here fucking with Dana and helping kind of maintain, uh, helping uh, maintain accountability with him through the, through the, uh, filter of like uh the public right like he's got a big platform no one likes to be criticized in front of 100 million people and that's what jake paul's able to do i don't know if he has 100 million followers the guy makes money boxing because he has a bunch of youtube dorks who watch him so i assume you need 100 million to do that i don't know how much i don't know how many it takes for you to transition from being internet dork to being boxing dork but he did it and i assume it's 100 million Till was arrested for a DUI in July in Stockholm. That's tough. I feel like Till has some uh, has some mental health stuff going on. Um, yeah, I hope he gets it worked out, man. Um, yeah, you're, you know, you're, the guy's like one in four in his last five, and he's getting arrested. Um, it's not a good look. It's not a good look. I'm always pulling for Darren Till. I hope nothing but the best for him. That's not a good look. Rockhold is saying that he may come back uh, for a fight at some point in the future. I don't want to see it, but good for you. I'm certain that you're always down for something like if you ever need enough money, right? Uh, you ever get in a tough enough spot, you can come make that 180k or 200k. They're going to pay you to fight in the UFC before uh, before your uh, profitability expires with them. Chael Sonnen said that Connor ain't ever going to be champ again. Uh, you know, that's probably true. That's probably true. You know, I think that, uh, I don't, I don't think he's doing it at welterweight. I got to see him at welterweight. I got to see how he does. I mean, the guy, the guy was at his best when he was way too big at 145. And that's the, that's the long and short of it. That's, you know, he went up to 155, caught lightning in a bottle with Jose, with Jose Aldo and like never really got to like prove himself, prove himself the way that we might've wanted for him to at 155. So I think his whole resume at 155 is maybe a little sus, and I definitely think that him trying to swim with the big sharks at 170 is like an insane move. And I hope nothing but the best for him. You know, he's great for the sport, and you know, I hope he keeps his nose clean. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see personally, I don't see Connor holding the belt anytime soon again um, for the UFC. So, Uncle Chael, we on the same page, big homie. Uh, Tyson Fury is like, I don't know what's going on with that guy. He challenged Anthony Joshua to a fight in London. And then if like a day or two later, he challenged, uh, Usyk to a fight. And like before all that, I thought that he retired, you know, like, he went from retiring to call out Anthony Joshua to calling out Usyk. And I can't keep up with him. I'm not a boxing person. Um, but I know that it's like on social media and the zeitgeist right now and it's on my radar. Um, but I haven't done enough reading into it. It's something that, that like, you guys as listeners may be interested in, and it might be something for you to put your nose to the ground and go and go find out. Um, you guys go check out the video of Le'Veon Bell knocking out Adrian Peterson. Um, like if you're if you're a Longhorn fan, which I am from I was born literally at Brackenridge Hospital in Austin, Texas. Um, and so I get to I get the big boy pass to be a to be a Longhorn fan for life. And uh, yeah, Adrian Peterson like scored like uh, god knows how many touchdowns against us back in the day so there's like a lifetime of resentment built up and it was pretty satisfying watching Le'Veon Bell knock that fool out not gonna lie not gonna lie petty college sports last a lifetime um the adult in me hates to see Adrian Peterson getting his bell rung like that like there's just no way that's good for your brain at all and, uh, and, you know, the, the altruist in me wants to see everybody preserving their health to the best of their ability. And I don't believe that getting binked in the face by Le'Veon Bell is what's best for Adrian Peterson's health in the long term. That being said, I'm a big fat ass. He's a, like a world caliber, a, a, like world class athlete. And so he's obviously like in better physical health than me. Um, so I can only throw so many stones from my big glass house. But that being said, there's definitely like in real life, a part of me that was like, 
aww when I saw that. Like, mm, I don't want that for Le'Veon Bell. Didn't you make enough money playing football? Jesus. You're going to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, what else happened? What else has happened in the world of sport? Wanderlei Silva retired and is passing the torch on to his son Thor. We'll see how that works out. But, uh, you know, Wanderlei Silva's been fighting for forever. Like, the stare down between him and Mirko Krokop, the fights between him and the Iceman, the fights between him and Rampage. Um, just, man, legend in the sport. Congrats to him on a, on a, on a career well played. Hope he rides off into the sunset happy and he gets to watch his son Thor do, uh, what, do what Thor does. More big news. UFC losing top talent to other organizations. Thiago Santos gone to PFL. He said, I ain't going to gatekeep for whoever at 205. I'm not going to gatekeep for Yuri Prochaska. For a hundred eighty thousand dollars a fight, I can go make big bank at PFL, and so you know, it's like a thing I talk about on damn near every podcast at this point is that the UFC is going to keep losing human resource if they're not willing to pay these guys the way they're worth. Here you are losing a guy like Thiago Santos, a guy who could have gate kept effectively for a long time to really figure out who the best in the world are, and now you don't have that. Like Thiago's gone to the PFL now over money. The UFC has got all the money in the world, and it's just so frustrating to see like these good guys who I feel like are too good to be in organizations other than the UFC happen to go out there and fight. In organizations other than the UFC in order to get their worth. I want these guys to get paid. God damn it, Dana. Pay these men. Me and you both know. There's no reason for Tiago Santos to be at the PFL other than for money. Ought to be ashamed. Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler have been confirmed. That's going to be a big fight. But again, they're only three rounds. It isn't the main event. I do believe they're trying to work towards John Jones uh, being the headliner there at the end of the year. We're going to see. Uh, and back to Darren Till. Uh, he is confirmed for a fight with Drikus Duplicis, who's a savage. I don't think that's necessarily a friendly matchup for Darren Till. Darren Till's 1-4 and four in his last five. And Drikus is 5-0 in his last five. So... Uh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be an uphill battle for him, um, but uh, yeah, guys, that's that's the review uh, for UFC 279. Man, uh, all kinds of crazy drama leading up to the fights. I feel like there's a major conspiracy at foot where they 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 uh, did something friendly for Nate on the way out because they saw how poorly it was trending, treating him badly. So they did some general fuckery, moved comms on around, he saved the day, he's playing heel, Nate rode off into the sunset, they boosted their, their pay-per-view sales, and everybody wins. Um, you know, the next fight that's coming up is going to be the uh, Sandhagen and Song Yadong fight, and Cheeky and Jukwai and Gregory Rodriguez, and Andrew, uh, Andre Feely and Bill Algio. I mean, three great fights all in a row on the on the main card for the Sandhagen song fight. So, uh, again, if I'm picking, I'm going Sandhagen, Rodriguez, and Feely. Uh, you know, I'm, we're going to see. I feel like I pick pretty good most of the time. Um, but the cool thing now is that there's a digital record. So I'm certain at some point in the future, some dork will go and make a compilation of all my picks and actually figure out the tally. And see what it's like. I'm certain that it's going to be, you know, better than 50%. But, <laughs> at any rate, uh, Armchair Army. This is Joshua. It's been a fantastic time. I appreciate everybody for lending me your ear and hearing my thoughts on this bullshit. And, uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Y'all stay safe, kids. Monkey mouth. Monkey mouth. Monkey mouth. Monkey mouth.